Welcome, I'm Don Renfro and I'm going to speak on imaging of headache. I'm a radiologist with the Radiology Associates of the Fox Valley. Uh, we're a private practice radiology group so covering several hospitals and clinics in the mid-north-east portion of the state of Wisconsin. Uh, and this lecture is for primary care practitioners. Uh, as noted on this slide, the number of seniors uh, graduating from U.S. medical schools and choosing residency spots in family medicine is going down considerably. Um, this lecture is not only for those people in uh, family medicine, but also for internal medicine physicians practicing general medicine, emergency room physicians to a certain extent, but uh, also for nurse practitioners and physicians assistants, um, anybody doing primary care. According to the Government Accounting Office, there were about 260,000 primary care physicians in the U.S. in 2005. At the same time, there were about 23,000 physician assistants. There were about 82,000 nurse practitioners. Um, primary care is probably going to be performed more and more, no matter uh, whose health care plan is rolled out by physician assistants and nurse practitioners. And there are at least three reasons for that. Um, for one, there's fewer people going into family medicine. Uh, for another, central planning, where most plans call for more PAs and NPs. And uh, for another, the market, where a lot of medical groups are now employing NPs and PAs in the workforce. So this talk is uh, for any primary care practitioner, and this, uh, it, it's as much for nurse practitioners and physicians' assistants, but I think also even internists with multiple years of experience would find some benefit in listening to this lecture because it's for anybody that orders radiology studies on the basis of clinical symptoms. Um, how do these lectures come about? Well, I'm a private practice radiologist. I have experience both in academics and in private practice. Uh, most of my time nowadays is spent at what's called Door County Memorial Hospital. Uh, Wisconsin is shaped somewhat like a mitten, and the thumb is Door County. It's a resort area north of Green Bay, Wisconsin. Um, the hospital in Door County is called Door County Memorial Hospital and I've worked there for a number of years. I'm the director of radiology, and I'm basically the only radiologist there most of the time. It's a small hospital, 22 beds. Uh, it's a critical access facility. It's about 50 miles from the nearest other hospital. Uh, it's a very nice facility. We have modern equipment, very pleasant there, uh, a very pleasant place to work. Um, the clinic is located adjacent to the hospital. It's a hospital or clinic, and there are multiple primary care physicians and practitioners in that clinic. Uh, I'm also director of Grand Rounds, and so in the monthly talks, what I found was when radiology topics came up, primary care practitioners tended to not really be interested in the physics of imaging or all the pretty pictures or all the detailed anatomy that we could see in an ideal situation, but rather, um, you know, what study did they order under what circumstances, what could the study show them, what diagnosis could they get from a particular imaging modality, and then uh, what they should do with that information, what couldn't, you know, what, what the imaging, what the imaging sh wouldn't show. And so these lectures are basically in response to that, where I take a given imaging symptom, in this case, headache, and I try to show you, uh, as a primary care practitioner, what imaging, what the studies it is that you're supposed to do on the basis of that imaging symptom. So in this particular case, we're going to talk about headache. And you have, you know, a few different options for imaging a headache, a CTs, MRs, angiograms, whatever. Um, at the same time, as a primary care practitioner, you want to do your best job, you want to take care of your patients, and you want to order the right test the first time every time. And that's what I'm going to try to show you how to do today. So I'll review three key points for imaging headache. The first thing I'm going to talk about, and the first point is that most primary headaches are one of three types, and they're usually diagnosed based on clinical features, and they usually don't require imaging. So even though this is an imaging talk, uh, the first thing I'm going to tell you was many of the times headaches don't need imaging. Uh, you'll see as a primary care uh, provider quite a few patients with headaches and the diagnosis of primary headache uh, is that of a headache that is not secondary to an anatomic cause like a subarachnoid hemorrhage or a brain tumor. Uh, the diagnosis of that headache typically relies on a clinical evaluation rather than any and most primary headaches fall into one of three types. There's a so-called tension type headache, a migraine headache, and a cluster headache. Patients with chronic intermittent headaches usually do not require imaging if there's no associated neurologic findings. Uh, and if the pattern of the headache is stable and the clinical features are 
one of those three types of headaches. Well, what are those three types of headaches? And, um, what are their features? First, there's tension headache. Now, tension headache um, has some criteria that are proposed by the International Headache Society. Uh, and the criteria in this talk are going to be based on those of the International Headache Society. Uh, the website, as noted on the earlier slide, is i-h-s.org. And basically, what you need to know about tension type headaches is that they're very common and a lot of people have them. Most people with tension type headaches don't really seek medical care because they recognize the headaches as temporary and self limited, and it's not particularly disabling. Uh, Benson and Jensen actually argued that infrequent episodic tension type headaches should be considered a normal phenomenon, not even a disease. And tension headaches apparently result from uh, sensitized dorsal uh, horn neurons misinterpreting innocuous stimuli as painful. Uh, the diagnosis is based on the criteria listed in this table and the absence of any associated radiologic, or I'm sorry, neurological features or any other unusual findings. And imaging is not typically performed. So what about the criteria? Well, the criteria include duration, typically 30 minutes to 7 days. Of course, if a patient has a headache for 28 minutes, it can still be a tension headache. Um, these criteria are general criteria that try to, for the most part, separate out the three types of tension headaches and make sure you're not missing something. So in addition to a duration between 30 minutes and 7 days, uh, tension headaches have two of the four characteristics of bilateral location, non-pulsating quality, a mild to moderate intensity, so not a really severe or worst headache in your life it, uh, phenomenon. And they have a lack of aggravation by routine physical activity. Now keep those characteristics in mind because later on you'll see with migraine headache that those characteristics are going to vary with migraine headache. Um, finally, there's some exclusion criteria for tension headaches. You can't really have nausea or vomiting and have a tension headache. Uh, you can have either photophonia, photophobia or phonophobia. But you can't have both, and you can't have any auras. If you have an aura, uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute, if you have an aura, you probably don't belong in the tension headache category. So tension headaches, those are the criteria. Don't really image those. You won't see very many of those because most people know that they have a tension headache. They take aspirin. If you have a patient with persistent and severe tension headaches, um, they may come to see you, but again, there are a lot of headache clinics out there, and you might end up sending your patients, if you're a primary care provider, to a tension or to a, a headache clinic uh, simply because it's going to be difficult to manage. Uh, how about migraine headaches? Okay, the Migraine Headache uh, International Headache Society criteria, the duration is 4 to 72 hours. And again, uh, they have a kind of a uh, Chinese menu here where you pick certain features. Two of these four characteristics are necessary for a migraine headache. They include a unilateral location, pulsating quality, moderate or severe intensity, aggravation by routine physical activity. And again, you'll notice that the tension type heading was bilateral, or this is unilateral. Migraines are pulsating, tension isn't. Uh, migraine headaches are more severe uh, in general than tension headache, and uh, they are aggravated by uh, routine physical activity. Exclusion criteria, uh, you should have nausea or vomiting if you have a migraine headache. Uh, not that you want that, but that's one of the criteria. And then, um, furthermore, you should have photophonia, photophobia or phonophobia, or both. Um, okay, what about auras? Now, auras are, uh, they consist of visual or sensory or speech symptoms that are characterized by a gradual onset of a duration less than an hour, and they have complete reversibility. Um, I will talk somewhat more about neurological symptoms in a different lecture, but in this case, you know, some examples of auras would be seeing flickering lights or feeling a pins and needles sensation. Sometimes auras will change sensory modalities and sometimes will change from positive to negative. But in general, you know, your main characteristics are that they're completely reversible. They last less than an hour. And once the person's had a few migraines, he usually knows he's had a migraine, the aura may precede the migraine. Um, now, if you have auras, you can have a tension, or I'm sorry, you can have a migraine headache without an aura. But if you have the auras, you need fewer attacks to diagnose migraine headache. So, for example, um, of the criteria that we mentioned above, 
If you don't have auras, you need five of those attacks to meet criteria for IHS or uh, society to have criteria for migraine. But if you have the auras, you only need two of those attacks to diagnose migraine. When do you image migraine? Well, you don't really if it's stable and doesn't change. Um, one thing that's interesting to know, note about migraine is that uh, while they're much less frequent than tension type headaches, the patients are a lot more likely to come to see a physician because the headaches are more severe and they have these you know, odd neurologic aura symptoms are associated with vomiting. Uh, and they really do, you know, they're, they're, they're really uh, troublesome. And so as a practitioner, a primary care practitioner, the most common kind of headache you're probably going to end up taking care of is a migraine headache because all the tension headaches, even though they're much more common, won't come to see it, but all the migraines will or at least could. Uh, migraine headaches are uh, thought to be secondary to neurogenic inflammation uh, and treatment, which uh, I'm not going to talk about in any details, kind of directed toward prevention and elimination of the inflammation. And again, these patients also, you may end up referring to a headache clinic because it, they can be tough to take care of. Um, Again, uh, these folks do not typically require imaging unless there's a change in the headache pattern. Uh, so what kind of patient would you image? Well, um, you might image someone with a worsening migraine headache, such as this 27-year-old woman. Um, I put some labels on a few of these slides just to show you some normal anatomy. This is a cross-sectional T1-weighted image through the brain at about the level of the orbits. Uh, the arrow there is on one of the eyeballs, just to give you an idea of about where in the head you are. So this is a transverse section you remember from anatomy. Uh, transverse section should contain the eyeball there in the front. There's some uh, retro bulbar fat and subcutaneous fat. On the T1-weighted sequence, that's going to image as increased signal or kind of white. Uh, the cerebellum is going to be located there centrally in the back, behind the midbrain and in front of the occipital lobes. Um, the brain stem is going to be in the center of the uh, picture on this image. Uh, the supracellar cistern is going to be in front of the brain stem, behind the orbits. And in the central portion of the supracellar cistern, you can see that little white dot is going to be the pituitary infundibulum coursing through the supracellar cistern. Another structure you'll see is the internal carotid artery. Um, and of course, those are paired structures of part of the circle of wells at the base of the brain. Um, finally, we have some abnormality in the form of this abnormally sized internal carotid artery on the patient's left, our right, marked by this arrow. Here's a T2-weighted image, same patient, about the same level at the level of the eyeballs. You'll see the supracellular cistern, the vessels around the outside of the supracellular cistern, including signal void or a black spot at the location where we saw the abnormality on the T1-weighted image. Anatomy again, here's the supracellular cistern marked by this arrow, uh, internal carotid artery marked by this arrow, and the abnormality marked by this arrow. So that abnormality was part of the internal carotid artery, the intracranial internal carotid artery. Part of the so-called carotid siphon is it courses through the supracellular cistern and it's got an aneurysmal distension at that particular spot. Here's the uh, T2-weighted image blown up on, the, on our left uh, without the arrow, on our right with the arrow. This image is a uh, time of flight um, two-dimensional maximum intensity projection, so all the blood flow is really bright on this. This is done uh, without any IV contrast and just relies on blood flowing through the vessels to create the image. Um, there are several hundred consecutive axial slices that are obtained and you can roll through those uh, using a workstation to kind of pick out what's normal and what's abnormal. Another way to do that more easily, um, uh, the arrow here marks the abnormality, the aneurysmal distension of the internal carotid artery. Um, here's a blow up of the same picture with the arrow on the aneurysmal distension of the internal carotid artery. Uh, another easier way to look at these things is with a uh, maximum intensity projection of the vascular tree. Here's the circle of Willis, including the aneurysm and all the vessels that uh, you can see in the circle of Willis. 
kind of go through some of those. The internal carotid artery uh, marked here. And of course, the repaired structures that come up on both sides and form the anterior portion of the circulation for the circle of Willis. Um, the internal carotid artery, after it go, goes through the carotid siphon and into the um, intracranially, it'll branch into the middle cerebral artery, which goes lateral, and the anterior cerebral artery, which goes medial. Um, the anterior cerebral artery then goes horizontally for a while. There's an A1 segment, which is a horizontal segment. There's an anterior communicating artery connecting the two anterior cerebral arteries. You can see the base of the two anterior cerebral arteries here. And then there's a more vertical segment of the anterior cerebral artery, which the arrow is on in our drawing, uh, or in our image, rather. The vertebral arteries are paired in the back of the brain. And of course, they form uh, together the basilar artery. And then the basilar artery then in turn splits into the two posterior cerebral arteries. So you've got the kind of circle of Willis images in a nutshell. Um, and you have the aneurysmal distension of the internal carotid artery in this patient. Um, another projection of the same structure and the same aneurysm here. So this woman had ongoing migraine headaches, which were getting worse. And uh, it, wa it was decided that she needed to undergo imaging because her headaches were getting worse. She had the imaging done, and there was an aneurysm. She was treated for that, got better, um, didn't have the aneurysm rupture, didn't have anything horrible happen to her. So it ended up being a good story. Here's a composite of all four of the images that we showed you, the T1 and T2 weighted axial images in A and B, uh, time of flight source image on the left in C, and then the pilot projection of the circle of Willis in D. Um, so that's migraine headache. What about cluster headache? Well, cluster headache is a little different than the other two types of primary headache. Uh, the cluster headache criteria include duration of 15 to 180 minutes, and then there's a somewhat longer list, and you need only one of these six characteristics, and these are usually ipsilateral to a unilateral headache. You have conjunctival injection and or lacrimation, you know, an eye symptom, nasal congestion or rhinorrhea, so a nasal symptom, eyelid edema, another kind of eye symptom, forehead and facial swelling, uh, meiosis or ptosis, more eye symptoms, and then a sense of restlessness or agitation. Uh, and you can see this headache is going to be completely different than your migraine and your tension headache. I mean, people with a clogged nose on one side for a brief period of time and a severe headache, uh, you have to think about cluster headache. So what are exclusion criteria? You've got to have a bunch of attacks. The cluster in cluster headache does not refer to the clustering of the headache on the same side of your head as the nose and throat and facial symptoms but rather clustering in time. So you usually have you know, six or eight or 10 or 12 of these kind of headaches that are real severe and last 15 minutes to an hour and then go away. And you'll have those over a two or three or four day period. And then you'll be okay for several months and then you'll have the cluster headaches again. Um, they also occur at least every other day. Um, and they make her up to eight times a day. So these are a real nuisance, very bad, but very rare. So in your whole career as a primary care practitioner, you may see you know, several hundred people with migraine headaches, a lot of people with tension headaches that may not come to you for the tension headaches, and you may never see somebody with a cluster headache. But it's very rare and it's pretty characteristic. Um, cluster headaches are a subtype of autonomic cephalgia, and they're an activation of the trigeminal autonomic reflex, and they cause pain. Um, similar pain can be caused, however, by intracranial aneurysm, meningioma, and pituitary tumor. That's why, unlike the other two types of primary headache, um, you usually do want to image these people. So even though the generalization is people with primary headaches don't get imaged, cluster headaches, you do image them. Why is that? Because they may not actually be having a cluster headache. They may be having a headache secondary to an intracranial aneurysm, or tumor. Um, now, having said that, if you went your whole career again without imaging anybody with what you thought was a primary headache, including all the people with cluster headaches, you probably wouldn't fail miserably because even of all those patients with cluster headache, almost all of them do have just a primary cluster headache and not a secondary headache to intracranial hemorrhage or aneurysm formation or tumor formation. Um, so, uh, if you only remember one thing out of this whole segment of the lecture, and that is image people, or I'm sorry, don't image people with primary headaches if they're stable, 
uh, then that's, that's a reasonable thing to remember. If you also remember the cluster headache, then that's an unusual headache and you do need to image that, that would be good too. So that's, that's headaches in a nutshell, primary headaches in a nutshell. What about secondary headaches? And remember, secondary means secondary to some other abnormality like a brain tumor or a hemorrhage uh, or increased intracranial pressure, some anatomic process on the inside, typically on the inside of the cranium, causing trouble. Uh, now, secondary headaches they'll often demonstrate danger signs, and they require immediate imaging in lumbar puncture. So they're completely unlike secondary headaches in that they really need imaged very quickly. Uh, so, what about imaging? Uh, well, you know, imaging for these secondary headaches, um, it's it's probably better to figure out who not to image because. There's so many inclusion criteria. You might even you might think more of like what are the exclusion criteria to not image somebody with a secondary headache. And really, if if you think of a secondary headache, there isn't there isn't any. I mean, if you really think they have a secondary headache to some intracranial process, you need imaging. But basically, another way to think of it is that if you have the typical clinical features of a primary headache from a tension type headache or a migraine headache, um, then you don't image those people. Um, However, if you have any change, uh, I'm sorry, if you don't have any change in those, in, in, that, in that primary headache pattern, then you don't do damage. If you don't have any new or concerning feature, no new seizure, no trauma, no fever, no focal neurological symptoms, then it's the same old, same old, you don't have to damage those people. Well, that list, that leads you with a long list of people that probably should cause you to have concern and cause you to want to go ahead and order uh, imaging. And the main one of these features is going to be the worst or first headache of someone's life. Uh, there's severe headaches with rapid onset, uh, and a lot of people call these thunderclap headaches. So any of, the, any of these features should provoke an immediate transport to the emergency room or CT scanner because you have to be worried about a severe intracranial abnormality going on with somebody with a thunderclap headache. Um, any features accompanying the headache, which should, uh, should cause concern, and there's a long list, mental status changes, fluctuations in the level of consciousness, focal neurological symptoms, fever, rapid onset of pain after strenuous exercise, headache spreading in the low neck and between the shoulders. Uh, furthermore, a new headache in a patient with cancer, any patient with cancer, suggests metastatic disease. Just like in the back, there's a ton of people with back pain, you often don't have to image people with back pain, but any person with back pain and cancer, you have to think about, does the patient have a cancer metastatic to their spine causing their back pain? Same deal here. A lot of people have headache, but any cancer patient with a new headache, you really have to worry about, well, do they have intracranial metastatic deposit as a cause of this new headache? Uh, the other category of patients that fit in this is uh, women who are in the later stages of pregnancy or just having delivered. There's a certain set of purple complications. They employ, include cortical vein thrombosis, carotid dissection, and pituitary apoplexy. Um, those patients need basically a brain MR to figure out whether they have any of those or some other problem associated with uh, pregnancy. Um, finally, if you have a headache and neck pain after a round of golf or after a visit to the chiropractor, you really have to suspect carotid artery dissection. And you need basically a CT angiography or MR angiography of the arch and carotid arteries, as well as the circle of Willis and intracranial imaging for those patients that have a severe neck and headache uh, after pretty much any physical exercise, but particularly seems to happen after rounds of golf because of the twisting motion in golf and after chiropractic manipulation. Um, we're going to follow several examples here of patients. Basically, these are mostly ER patients. They came in with additional features or, or uh, thunderclap headaches. So here's a 61-year-old woman with headache and altered mental status. I have some anatomy marked on this slide. You see the sylvian fissures anteriorly with CSF signal uh, density in them, or CSF density in them. Uh, the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle has a little curvilinear appearance. Of course, those are paired structures. You see them on both sides. The tentorium cerebellum uh, is marked there. That's the portion of the dura that invests in between the supratentorial and infratentorial aspects of the brain. Usually you can see it as kind of an oblique line on 
the CT studies, and that'll separate the anterior and posterior fossa structures. So in the posterior fossa, of course, you have the cerebellum. Anterior fossa, the cerebral hemispheres, basal ganglia. Um, so in this case, this patient has a large uh, white structure marked by the arrows in the posterior fossa that does not belong there. This is a pre-contrast study. So anything that, that is that dense on a pre-contrast study pretty much has to be blood, um, unless there's some instrumentation or somebody's put contrast into the brain. So this patient had a large cerebellar hemisphere, uh, I'm sorry, cerebellar hemorrhage. Uh, she actually had a headache initially, then became dizzy, then started losing consciousness and was hard to arouse by the time she got to the emergency room, and she later succumbed to her hemorrhage. So that was a patient with uh, severe headache and altered mental status. Here's a patient with headache and neurologic symptoms of dizziness and slurred speech. This is an axial head CT done at the level of the uh, orbits are, are just below on the left side, of, or uh, our, uh, our left side, the patient's right side. Uh, and it's almost impossible to get the patients exactly square in the scanner. You can use uh, a workstation to kind of straighten that out if you need to. But basically, this was the original source image. And in this case, you know, this, there's only a very subtle abnormality here in this patient with uh, headache and, and dizziness and slurred speech. Um, this is a blow up of the posterior aspect of the CT scan. And you see the brain stem in the middle of the image. And then the cerebellum for the posterior central portion of the image. And what you can notice is that on the patient's left side, our right side, the arrow points to a fissure in the normal cerebellar hemisphere. On the other side, he's lost the fissures in a cerebellar hemisphere, and that's a, a feature of brain swelling. This patient had an MR done shortly after that. This is the diffusion-weighted image of the MR. And it's done at about the same level as that CT scan was. And you can see, marked here by the arrow, um, extensive diff uh, restricted diffusion in the cerebellar hemisphere on the same side that he had brain swelling on the CT. And this was an acute cerebellar infarction causing a headache, dizziness, and slurred speech. Here's a 65-year-old man that came in. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the same uh, case, the 65-year-old man with headache and neurologic symptoms. And I'm just showing you side by side the CT scan with relatively, relatively subtle effacement of sulci on the CT scan, and then restricted diffusion in the cerebellar hemisphere on the MR study. Okay, so here's another case. And again, these are all people that had headache plus something else. Uh, in the other two cases, they had a headache and changed mental status, headache, dizziness, slurred speech. This man came in headache, fever, uh, ended up with an MR study, the axial flare image here, uh, through the level of the eyeball, shows some asymmetry in the temporal lobes with the patient's right temporal lobe on our left, showing some loss of volume and some increased signal intensity. It's a little wider than the contralateral side. Here shown. Uh, in the, uh, between the arrows. This scan is a little higher on the same patient. This is a flare image on flare images, which are fluid attenuated inversion recovery images. The images will show CSF as black, pathology as white, and gray and white matter as pretty much gray and white. Uh, I'm sorry, gray and, no, gray and black. So basically what you have here is on the patient's right side, our left, there's some abnormal increased signal along the uh, superficial aspect of, or I'm sorry, along the deep aspect of the temporal lobe, um, where the arrow is here. Um, this is another image through the same patient. This one is a, a T2-weighted image. And again, on this image, the CSF is white, and the temporal lobe on our right, the patient's left, is pretty normal in appearance. The temporal lobe on the contralateral side is uh, abnormal in that it has increased signal intensity and some loss of volume with some accentuation of the size of the sulci. There. 
these are the comparison of the uh, T1-weighted image and the flare image, and then you can appreciate again increased signal in the temporal lobe on the patient's right side, where the arrow is here. Here's a four-on-one picture of uh, the patient is imaging features on the T2 flare T1 and post-contrast T1-weighted image. On the post-contrast image, you can see enhancement of that region of the brain and the temporal lobe. This patient did have herpes encephalitis, a chronic condition leading to some brain loss. And you know, there are other findings that could, other disease processes that could cause uh, this, this set of findings, but it's pretty specific. Um, and the patient did end up having a biopsy done and a diagnosis of herpes encephalitis. Um, now, again, I told you before, anytime you have a patient with a uh, primary tumor, known tumor, and new onset headache, you have to think about metastatic disease. In this particular case, the unenhanced axial CT study shows a posterior fossa without really any remarkable features. Uh, the uh, temporal lobes are seen there in a bit of the lower uh, frontal lobes toward the anterior aspect of the patient on the top of the slide. Um, however, after the jet contrast, you can see an abnormal RIM, R-I-M, or RING, R-I-N-G, RING, or RIM-enhancing lesion in the patient's left cerebellar hemisphere. Here's a picture showing both the pre- and post-contrast with an arrow demonstrating the abnormality. Uh, this is abnormal contrast enhancement along the margins of a metastatic deposit where there's a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. And this shows you a case of a man with known lung cancer who had metastatic deposits causing a new headache. A little bit larger view of the same region. Again, image on the left, pre-contrast. Hard to see that metastatic deposit without contrast. Image on the right with contrast. So in review, headache, any additional feature, change in mental status, neurologic findings, patient with known cancer, patient with fever, image, try to figure out why it is that they're having the headache, is there an intracranial process. Um, now, what about subarachnoid hemorrhage? There's cases where you don't have a tumor inside your brain, but you have blood inside, your, uh, in, in, inside the skull, or even in the brain or along the surface of the brain, and that causes a severe headache. Uh, blood is very obnoxious material as far as the brain is concerned, and it will cause reflex vasospasm and a lot of pain through meningeal irritation. About 20% of patients who state they're having the worst headache of their life will have a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, when the head CT demonstrates acute subarachnoid hemorrhage, the cause must be established as rapidly as possible because without treatment, the likelihood of death in the next 30 days is greater than 50%. So a subarachnoid hemorrhage is an awful, awful thing to have. Even if you survive it, I mean, your prognosis is horrible. And it gives you the worst headache of your life, too. So how do you figure out what's causing the hemorrhage? Uh, it can be accomplished immediately with CT angiography of the cerebral vascular tree. That's often the preferred imaging method of choice because you can do that right at that moment with the patient on the CT table. Um, and then they can be taken immediately for clot evacuation uh, or treatment of their aneurysm. Um, the modern CT uh, angiography with a helical CT scanner is probably 90% or more accurate at identifying ruptured aneurysms. Um, the other way to think about it though is that if the patient's stable enough to undergo catheter angiography, the technique not only allows a gold standard for the diagnosis, it is a little better than CT angiography, but it also allows for life-saving uh, percutaneous therapy at the same time. So the decision of which specialist to use, neurosurgeon versus interventional neuro, uh, neuroradiologist, and, and what technique is employed for treatment, either open repair or percutaneous inter intervention, that varies a lot with local expertise, and you'll probably know in your area who you have to work with and, and what they do. Um, if you have a CT, and it shows subarachnoid hemorrhage. And again, you know, as a primary care practitioner, you may not be ordering these exams, but it's just good to know this in case you know your your patient, somebody you know, or so, even someone in your family goes away for all this imaging. It might be helpful to know this stuff. Uh, when a CT demonstrates a subarachnoid hemorrhage, but the angiogram and catheter angiography 
fails to find any leaky aneurysm or cause, then uh, the other causes could include like a vascular malformation or intracranial arterial dissection or vasculitis. Uh, if you can't find any of those things on the angiography portion of the study, even though they've got a subarachnoid hemorrhage, then they usually end up doing an MR with and without contrast, and they're looking for alternative explanations for subarachnoid hemorrhage, like angiographically occult vascular malformations or bleeding pituitary adenoma. Um, so if the CT and the MR and the CT angiography catheter, if all of it's negative with a patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage, usually the recommendation is to repeat the angiogram in a couple of weeks because you can have basal spasm masking an aneurysm acutely. Uh, so there's a lot of workup involved in these patients. And you basically have to keep going until you find the cause of the, of the hemorrhage. And, and sometimes you don't, but it's usually, you, usually people are pretty dedicated about finding the cause. Because again, that first slide showed you half of those people die in uh, a month if they don't get the cause diagnosed and fixed. So um, now, what about those patients that have a thunderclap headache and you're pretty sure clinically they've got the worst headache in their life, they've never had a headache before, they come in, they've just got, they're just bloody awful, and you really think this patient must have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and yet the CT scan is negative. Uh, what usually happens then? Well, usually those people get a lumbar puncture because a lumbar puncture is going to be more sensitive to small amounts of hemorrhage, which you won't see on the CT scan. And if you have that scenario, they're still most likely having a leaking aneurysm, and they need the full bore treatment, just like is if they had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. I mean, they have had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you just diagnosed it by an LP instead of by the CT. So those patients go off and get their catheter angiography and, and whatnot. Okay, uh, this fellow is a 60 year old man. He had a thunderclap headache, he had nausea, he had vomiting, came in, he got a CT scan right away. What does it show? It shows a massive amount of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Unlike the pictures earlier I was showing you where there's CSF density in the supracellar cistern in the middle of the head, this one is full of blood with all kinds of white stuff in there. Uh, also along the, um, the fissures radiating out from the uh, supracellar cistern, it's also full of blood. Uh, arrows here along the um, extensions of the supracellar cistern in the subarachnoid space. Um, a little, little higher cut on the same patient, again you see blood uh, in the uh, perimesencephalic cistern and along the sylvia and the fissures bilaterally. So this guy had a lot of intracranial hemorrhage. Um, arrow here in the intraperticular cistern where there's blood. So he went off dutifully to his angiography, he was referred elsewhere from our hospital because we don't do angiography in our hospital. He was referred uh, to a place where they did do angiography and what did it show? Well, here's the angiogram. Uh, this is a selective injection into the um, right internal carotid artery. The arrow here on this more uh, blown up picture of the same uh, set of the same image shows you the internal carotid artery and it shows you an outpouching or aneurysm off of the internal carotid artery filling with contrast. This image shows a contrast run before aneurysmal coiling and after aneurysmal coiling. Uh, the picture on the our right has the aneurysmal coil in it. There's an arrow by the aneurysmal coil, uh, by the aneurysm on our left with the coil on our right. So this person survived his hemorrhage, survived the aneurysm coiling, and is doing well. So he is not one of the 50% that didn't make it, he did make it. So that's subarachnoid hemorrhage. What about intraparenchymal hemorrhage? CT in headache patients may, may show you intraparenchymal hemorrhage. Um, they're also called intraparenchymal hematomas. Uh, these hematomas can accompany a large variety of diseases and uh, they include primary metastatic brain tumors, hypertension, presumed vascular rupture, uh, drug abuse, including uh, sympathomimetic mimetic drugs, uh, particularly methamphetamine, cocaine, ecstasy. Uh, and they can also occur as a complication of AIDS, amyloid angiography, uh, bleeding diastheses, and anticoagulation therapy. And finally, they can occur because of a parenchymal vascular malformations. Uh, the lesions will typically be referred to interventional neuroradiologists or neurosurgeons or neurologists. And these specialists will most likely order, in addition to the head CT that you got to diagnose the interparenchymal hematoma, uh, 
they'll end up uh, typically getting either arteriography or an MR, um, and sometimes a contrast enhanced CT to kind of further work up the abnormality. Um, now, this is a 40-year-old man who had a headache, who had an intraparenchymal hemorrhage. Uh, this is actually a picture of him before he had his intraparenchymal hemorrhage. And the reason I'm showing you this picture is that it shows uh, the patient's known intracranial oligodendroglioma. So he had a primary brain tumor that was known. And uh, this wasn't when he had his headache. This was before he had his headache. This is after he had development of a severe new headache. And this guy had an intracranial tumor that was known, and he bled into the tumor. Uh, this image shows you the arrows along the tumor before and after the bleeding. On the after picture, you can see a, uh, a blood fluid level uh, where he's bleeding into the tumor. Um, and uh, this is a case of an intraparenchymal hematoma in a known brain tumor. Um, this fellow is a 51-year-old with a headache, slurred speech, and some left-sided weakness. The image uh, labeled A here shows a uh, head CT done for a different indication well before his development of headache. Um, and note that there is a small calcification in the cord plexus on our left, the patient's right. And then after his uh, new onset of headaches, slurred speech, and left-sided weakness, so he has a headache and he's got the additional neurological features to get the CT, he ends up having an intraparenchymal hematoma. Uh, and this was on the basis of hypertension. Here's a 79-year-old who was anticoagulated uh, for atrial fibrillation and had a headache and acute mental status change. The head CT shows a huge intraparenchymal hematoma in the patient's left hemisphere uh, here, marked by the arrow, there's some surrounding uh, edema of the brain. Um, here's an image somewhat lower down on the same 79-year-old patient. Not only is there a large intraparenchymal hematoma, but there's an intraventricular hematoma as well, and that's filling up the ventricle on the patient's left side. Um, here's a shot of two images, one a little higher in this patient, one a little lower here on the Image in A marks the intraparenchymal hematoma caused by um, anticoagulation. And then the image marked in B, the arrow is on the intraventricular uh, hemorrhage in this patient. Here's a 45 year old woman who had headache and left facial droop. In this particular uh, image, what you see is a CT scan performed at about the level of the lateral ventricles. There's a hematoma in the left hemisphere and blood in the left ventricle. The arrow here is on the hematoma in the left hemisphere. And the second arrow here is in the hematoma in the ventricle in this patient. So why did she have an intraparenchymal hemorrhage, this 45 year old woman? Well, she did get an MR. You can see the acute hemorrhage at the location of the arrow on this image. And then this arrow, a little lower down, uh, <clears throat> shows you the complex vascular malformation that caused her bleeding. This image is a coronal image of the same patient, and this shows, at the location of the arrow, the vascular malformation, and there's associated uh, parenchymal brain changes next to that. Um, This image is the vascular malformation done with an uh, MR angiogram, and you can see a tangle of vessels there, and that's the spot that bled. This is the arrow on the tangle of vessels, um, showing you the abnormality. This is a coronal image, and finally a coronal image with an arrow on it, number 109, uh, and that shows you a vascular malformation, and that's what bled in this particular patient. So here's four pictures showing the 45-year-old woman with a CT, intraparenchymal, and intraventricular hemorrhage. Uh, image B is the T2-weighted image showing the intraparenchymal hemorrhage and associated ABM. Uh, image C is the coronal image showing the ABM and associated brain abnormality. And then the uh, MR angiogram in, in D 
So those are all cases of patients who had um, intraparenchymal hemorrhage. How about subdural hemorrhages? Subdural hemorrhages are usually also seen in anticoagulated patients, frequently older patients. And when you're doing head CTs for headaches occasionally, you'll see subdural hematomas. Um, sometimes there'll be trauma involved in subdural hematomas. The CT features are pretty characteristic. They're pretty diagnostic. The clinical issue in these patients usually is it worthwhile to surgically drain the hematoma. It's usually done through a burr hole in the cranium. Or do you allow the body to resorb the hematoma without any intervention? This particular case was a 65-year-old, uh, I'm sorry, 66-year-old man with headache, sore speech, and left-sided weakness that had an acute subdural hematoma. Um, so that brings us to the final point I'm going to make today, and that is that secondary headaches may rarely be insidious, and they can mimic primary headaches. So uh, most of your patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage will present with a thunderclap headache. Uh, or some similar dramatic event. And most patients with subdural hematomas and brain tumors and strokes usually have some feature in their history or physical exam that'll tell you that they're having trouble. Uh, they have some feature other than just a headache. There are exceptions to this rule though. And in the first section, I talked about whether or not it's reasonable to image patients with typical features, and usually it's not. Um, in the second section, I noted that it's reasonable to uh, uh, image those patients with new or different features. So having said all that, what is the point here? The point here is that um, headache is a common manifestation of, for example, such uh, uh, lesions as brain tumors, primary brain tumors. As a matter of fact, one study of 111 patients with brain tumors found headache in about half. Uh, tension type headache accounted for about 80%, migraine about 9%, other headaches about 14%. Um, of course, as far as brain tumors go, they'll eventually produce some neurologic symptoms, usually. Uh, and because of the presumed uh, primary headache actually representing a second, uh, I'm sorry, let me say that again. Because some patients have a high level of concern, or because you as a clinician feel that there's something not quite right about this patient's history for a primary headache, you're going to end up probably imaging some patients with primary headache. And it's going to be up to your judgment to do so. And it's going to be a difficult judgment because there are cost considerations and CTs and MRs are not cheap and a lot of people have headache. But at the same time, you know, given the uh, climate of practice in the United States, you really don't want to miss a primary brain tumor. So I'm going to kind of punt on this one and say, you know, secondary headaches, they may need imaging, and it's kind of up to the patient and the doctor and their decision about whether and when to get that imaging done. Um, this particular case is a 79-year-old woman with headache, and nausea, and vomiting, and she did get a brain MR done. And what we found on her was that she had a pituitary tumor that explained her appearance primary headache, which of course wasn't a primary headache at all, it was a secondary headache, secondary to pituitary adenoma, but her clinical features were those of a primary headache. So again, that's kind of a difficult situation to be in. This is a, uh, two images of the same patient in A, a sagittal T1-weighted MR imaging with the arrow on the pituitary adenoma, and in B, a coronal T1-weighted image with arrows on the pituitary adenoma. I'll close with one other case, and I will discuss this uh, particular diagnosis elsewhere in this set of lectures, but basically this is a 21-year-old with an unexplained headache uh, that came for imaging, and that was a T1-weighted image. This is uh, image 119. This is the T2-weighted image, and there's a fluid level in the frontal sinus. This is a blow-up of that same image. There's an arrow on the fluid level in the patient's right frontal sinus. The blue arrow here is on some inflamed tissue in the frontal sinus. And what this represents is two pictures, one of which is the current MR with the patient with unexplained headaches, and the other of which is uh, empty air cells done for facial trauma several years before CT scan 
showing that that was sinus was clear. So what did this patient have? This patient had an unexplained headache, ended up getting an MR for it, and had sinus disease. Now I'm going to talk about sinus disease in a different talk, but I do point out here that patients with sinus disease can have headaches, and sometimes those patients have a peculiar pattern to their headache that doesn't really suggest sinus disease. They may not have drainage, they may only have uh, pressure, or, or they have symptoms that don't really quite fit with sinus disease or attention type headache. And sometimes you'll have a diagnosis made because you do include a fair amount of sinus uh, of the perinatal sinuses on a head CT. So I, I guess it wouldn't be, you know, it's not going to be the biggest surprise if somebody goes off to get imaging for um, a headache and ends up with a diagnosis of sinusitis. So that, then I conclude that uh, I've, I've reviewed three different points for imaging of, of headaches, uh, and those points are. Uh, number one, most primary headaches are one of three types, uh, tension type headache, migraine headache, cluster headache. Uh, the diagnosis is based on clinical features. Tension and migraine are going to form the overwhelming majority of those headaches, so don't, don't require imaging. Cluster headaches are rare, but do require imaging, usually with MR without with contrast, MRA of the circle of Willis. Second point, secondary headaches often demonstrate danger signs like fever, neurologic symptoms, uh, or they're the worst or first headache the patient's ever had, so it's called thunderclap headache. These are bad things. They require immediate imaging, uh, CT to rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage. If the CT is negative, typically a lumbar puncture right away to make sure there's not occult subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and then uh, uh, often after that, they may end up getting additional imaging if they have a positive scan and they need to go off and get angiography. Um, Finally, uh, the waffle point, you know, secondary headaches, what are you going to do with those? Uh, secondary headaches that are insidious and mimic primary headaches, it's a very difficult call. Uh, you're going to have to decide, you know, who in your practice you want to image uh, that you think probably has a primary headache, but you have some issue uh, that they may have a secondary headache because of maybe some neurologic symptoms or something like that. Um, so that's the end of this talk.